Good morning. Good to have you today. So glad each one came today. I'm going to invite your attention to 1 John chapter 4 this morning. <clears throat> and of course, we'll be putting it on the screen. Um, and what's on the screen will be out of the English Standard Version. So it may look a little different if you're following along with your King James, which is fine. 1 John chapter 4. I want to speak to you on the topic of the power of love. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through, 21, 7 through 21, say, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. I love how John puts things, just straightforward and simple, and yet it's not something that's shallow, it's very deep. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Love is something that happens. It's shown through action. And John says the way God showed his love was by sending his only son to us. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. We may not be able to see God, but we can see him in our actions. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. This morning I'd like to talk to you on one of my favorite subjects from the Bible. In fact, it's, it's possibly could be said that it is the most important subject in the Bible, and that is the power of of love. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we bow before you this morning. We're seeking you. Lord, you know my weakness, and you know the needs of your people. I pray that you would bridge the gap between my weakness and their need. Help us today, we pray. Give us your strength. May it be done all in your name, and for your honor, and for your glory. In Jesus' name, we humbly ask. Amen. I love the Apostle John. Many have Many have said it, probably much better than I ever could, of uh, how beautiful John's writings are. Um, and in, in the, the epistles, the, the epistles of John, uh, first, second, and third John, he writes to the church and he has a very tender tone, a very affectionate, you can sense the affection that John has for his audience, for those who are going to read these letters. He speaks of them more than once as little children. He, he, it's like he has this picture of him as the father who is trying to help these young believers in Christ, newborn babes, trying to help them on their journey. And uh, he speaks with a, very ten, a great tenderness and a great compassion. He speaks with simplicity, and yet he speaks with incredible depth. Um, and he, he's, he so often speaks about love. And for that reason, he's often called the apostle of love. Today in our reading, he challenges us to live in the power of love, and I also see here three reasons that he gives us why we should do so, and that's what I want to talk about this morning. The first reason I see is that we should love because it is, the mark of, is our mark of authenticity, our mark of authenticity. 
In verses 7 and 16, he mentions this. He says, whoever loves God has been born of God. And verse 16, he says, here's how we know uh, um, whoever God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. I don't know how many enjoy watching shows like the Antiques Roadshow or similar things where uh, antiques are dealt with, uh, maybe even pawn, sh- what is that one, the, the, the pawn shop one. Uh, pawn, I, can't, I, can't, I can't think of it, but they always bring in somebody who can authenticate whether or not the thing is legitimate, right? And when, and when the assessor comes in and he looks at the piece or she looks at the piece, they will say, if you look here, you'll notice this particular identifying mark. Here's a, a special mark that this particular person or this particular company always put on their pieces. And if it's a fake, it won't have that mark. Uh, but this one has the right marks. It has, has all, the, all the marks of authenticity. This is a legitimate thing. Or they'll even say, uh, nope, this one looks like a forgery because it doesn't have these particular things that are always on the things that are authentic. John 13, 35, Jesus was talking to his disciples. He said, by this will all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. John emphasizes love because he says love is the mark of authenticity of a believer. If you're not living in love, he basically would say, you're not a follower of Christ. But if you see somebody who is living love and their life is showing love, you can say, I know that person. That person's a follower of Jesus. Love is, in fact, a natural byproduct of being a child of God. The desire to love comes naturally when God brings us to life spiritually. It's something that we want to do right off the bat. When we come to God and we are saved, there is something in our hearts that responds to his grace that says, oh, I want to show this love to somebody else. I want to respond. I want to, I want to love God back for the things that he has done for me. However, that's not to say there won't be times when we're tempted not to love. <laughs> there are plenty of times that come up in our lives when the situation, if we're going to love, it's going to cost us something. And when we're looking at that from the front side, Sometimes it can be tempting to say, ah, maybe not this time. Maybe I don't really want to pay that price. John, if he could speak to us in those moments, he would say, remember, you're a child of God. Show the world who your daddy is. Love like he loves, even if it hurts. Now, there's a paradox, because the reality is when we begin to love like Jesus... Sometimes there will be pain in that loving, but that pain is swallowed up in the very love that seems so difficult to begin with. Whatever pain we experience in loving, it's swallowed up by the glory of the love itself. We should love because it's our mark of authenticity. Love is the mark of God's children. The second reason I see is in verses 11 and 19. He says we should love because it is the honorable response to God's love for us. In verse 11, he says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And in verse 19, he says we love because he first loved us. Even the heathen kings recognize the importance of responding of honoring someone who has done something good for you. I think back to the, the story of Esther. In the book of Esther in the Old Testament, Xerxes, who was by no means anything, uh, any kind of truly religious individual, no, by no means a godly individual, uh, he was one evening uh, having his, the, the great tales of his, his reign were being read to him because he couldn't go to sleep. And as the person who was there was reading those tales of all these things that had happened in his reign, he came across a story of an individual who had uncovered a plot to take the king's life. And that man who had uncovered the plot went and reported it. And the, the conspirators of that plot were put to death. And King Xerxes, and the man kept going on, he went on to the next, the next item, the next thing that happened in, in his reign. And Xerxes stopped him and he said, wait a minute, hold, stop, stop, stop. He said, you didn't tell me what we did for that man who saved my life. And the guy who was reading the, 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 the history, he said, it doesn't say. As far as we can tell, nothing was done for this man. Well, Xerxes immediately said, we can't have this happen. 
And he immediately began to, it troubled him until he went and he actually had uh, Mordecai honored in a great way. Again, so th this man, this heathen king who was by no means uh, any, any kind of godly person, if he could see that when somebody does something good for us, we need to respond, the honorable thing to do is to respond, how much more should we, when we experience God's love, understand that we should love him back, love him in response? You don't have to be a believer to recognize that if God has done something good for me, then the honorable thing would be for me to do something to, for God in response. John says the only appropriate response to God's love is for us to love him back. And we can do that by trying to live our lives in a way that would please him and by loving the things that he loves. And when we begin to love the things that God loves, we quickly, we, quickly, we quickly realize that he loves all people. And if God loves all people, then loving my brother is the least that I can do to show my gratitude for God's love for me. God's love for me is not something that just responds, that just turns into a relationship between me and him. It turns into action for my fellow brother, my fellow man. <coughs> Here's the question. Are you living your life today as an honorable response to God's love. Do you love him back? Do you love the things that he loves? Do you love your brother like God loves you? Loving God is the only appropriate response to the love that he has shown for us. The last reason I see <clears throat> is we should love because it delivers us from fear. In verses 7 and eight, 17 and 18, John says, By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. And then in verse 18, he says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. In these verses, John highlights one of the most incredible features of love, the power to conquer fear. Now, someone may ask, well, how, how can love cast out fear? Well, John's words show us how. He points out the connection between fear, oh, sorry, he points out the connection that love and fear have with judgment. In verse 17, he says that love gives us confidence for the day of judgment. And in verse 18, he says that the power of fear comes from the threat of punishment. How does love give us confidence for the day of judgment? By providing the remedy for the punishment we deserve. Love gives us confidence in the day of judgment because love is what gives us the remedy for the punishment that we deserve. You see, there's two things that threaten to undo us when our lives are weighed in judgment. Our sins against God and our sins against our fellow man. Love takes care of those sins. When we walk in love, we find a remedy for the things that we have committed against our fellow man, for the things that we have committed against God. Love first takes care of the sins that we have committed against our fellow man. If we are truly walking in love, then we will go and make right the things that we have done wrong against our fellow man. Someone might say, well, wait a minute, that, that's backwards. Shouldn't our first concern be our, our sins against God? Shouldn't we take care of those things first? Well, you might think so, but Scripture actually tells us otherwise. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24, Jesus highlights the important to us, importance to us of being reconciled to our brother before we can be reconciled to God. He said, So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother. And then come and offer your gift. Now to put these verses in context, in Jesus' day, this was before he died and rose from the grave, before he paid the price for our sins, the proper way to worship God was by bringing sacrifices to the temple. And the priests would help you offer your sacrifices as an act of worship or as an act of atonement, whatever the case may be. 
Sometimes you would bring a sacrifice because you knew you had done something wrong. You knew you had sinned and you wanted to show God that you were sorry and that you wanted to make an atonement for it. You would bring a sacrifice as a way of saying, I'm sorry, God, for the things that I've done. Would you forgive me? Sometimes, though, you would bring a sacrifice as a thanks for the blessings God had given you. During harvest time, they would bring a piece, a part of their harvest, and they would offer that back to God as a way of saying, thank you, God, for the blessings that you have given to us. And sometimes they would just offer their sacrifices as a way of saying, God, you're great, you're, you're awesome, you're mighty, and we love you, just as an act of praise. And Jesus tells us in these verses, he basically says, okay, that's great. Bringing your sacrifices to God is a good thing. But if you have sinned against your brother and you haven't made that right, God isn't interested in your sacrifice until you go take care of that relationship with your brother. Now, this is not a hard concept for someone who truly loves to understand. If I truly love my brother, then I will pursue reconciliation with him as much as I possibly can. Now, granted, there may be times when the sins that I have committed may create so deep a rift that full reconciliation and restoration may be incredibly difficult, maybe even impossible. Sometimes the person we have wronged will cut off our attempts to make amends for our actions. Not everyone lives in love. And sometimes we wrong somebody who has no interest in forgiving. That happens. However, if we have not made a genuine, sincere effort to make restitution to our brothers for our sins, we can't claim that God has forgiven us. If we haven't sought to, 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 to bridge that gap, done everything we can in our power, at least on our end, regardless of what they choose to do on their end, if we haven't done everything in our power on our end, we cannot claim that God has forgiven us. Now, that's not me. That's Scripture. Jesus said, you have to go make reconciliation with your brother first before you can come and ask God to forgive you. God isn't interested in our sacrifices until we first talk to our brother. In fact, this may seem bold, but we can say with confidence that if someone is claiming that God has forgiven their sins, but they have not made anything like an appropriate effort to seek reconciliation to the individual they have wronged, we know that person is not telling the truth when they say, God has forgiven me. That's a heavy thought. It's a heavy thought. But the flip side is, if we have done everything in our power, we have sought that reconciliation because we love, we can know that God's love brings us confidence. When God, when God's love has flooded our hearts to the point that we are ashamed of the hurt that we have caused, we have sh are ashamed of the pain our brother has experienced because of our actions, and we have humbly done everything we can to make restitution, then we can have confidence that God also forgives us. Love casts out fear because if we have done everything we can and we've sought, we've we've tried to make the amends for us, God has made a way for us. To, to be whole. He has made a way for us to be healed. He has made a way for us to avoid those eternal consequences, even for our sins against our brother. Now, the devil may try to hold our past over our heads. He may say, remember what you did? What do you think people would think of you if they knew what you did in your past? What, what would they do? What do you think they would think? He'll try. And not just him, but people who are led by him, they will try, say, I, I know things about you. I know things about your past. How do you think people would feel if they knew what I know? The reality is, though, if we're walking in the light of love, if we have done everything we can to make amends with our brother, then we can have confidence that God does not hold our past against us. Micah 7, 19 tells us, He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. 
Love gives us confidence in the day of judgment because when we know that we have pursued love for our brother and we have pursued love for God, then he wipes those things away. Naturally, the same thing is true of our sins against God. (laughs) He doesn't remember them against us. There is no fear in love. There is no fear of punishment because his perfect love casts out that fear. We don't have to live in bondage to the fear of our past. There's also another reason that love casts out fear. It's not only because it, it does it remove fear because it pursues reconciliations for the sins I've committed, but it also casts out fear because love trusts God for the future. It trusts him for the future, including whether or not my past gets broadcast for the world to see. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't want my past sins to be made known. I don't want you to know about the things I've done. I'm ashamed of those things. And it would hurt. It would hurt incredibly if somebody who knew what I had done was to broadcast those things for the world to see and say, these are things he's done. It it wouldn't matter to most people, uh, it wouldn't matter to some people whether or not I had made reconciliation for them, that I had pursued restitution, that I had gotten God's forgiveness. Some people don't care. And it would hurt to have those things put out for the public to see. However, when the threat of those things being revealed is held over my head, I know that I can rest in the knowledge that God loves me, And whatever he allows to come into my life, he has a plan to work it for my good. Even if it means revealing my shameful past. Here's the reality. Now, this might be a little bit hard for us to swallow sometimes. I'm going to speak for myself, though. The shame of my past is 100% due to the choices that I made. When I confessed my sins to God, I took 100% responsibility for my choices. I made restitution for the sins I had committed against others. I repented of the sins I had committed against God. There's a song in our hymnal we don't sing very often, but it talks about the old account. There was an old account that was racking up debts of sin. It said, but I went to the account keeper and I settled the account. There was a day when I settled the account. It wasn't through anything I could do, but the blood of Jesus was applied and my sins were forgiven. I made restitution and I was forgiven. However, again, this may be a little hard, but the reality is I know that while God has forgiven me, sometimes our actions have far-reaching effects that we have not encountered yet like throwing a stone in a pond. There's the big splash when you first do it, but then as you watch, the ripples go and they go and they go and they go and they go. I know my sins. There may be a day yet where one of those ripples comes along and something I did in the past, something that's totally under the blood, something that's completely 100% forgiven, one of those ripples may catch up to me yet. But I can rest in the knowledge that God loves me and whatever he allows to come into my life, he's going to use it for good. Sometimes it's for my good. Sometimes it's to make me a better person. Sometimes it's for somebody else. I heard somebody one time say, sometimes God lets us go through trials just so someone else can see what it's like when a child of God goes through trials. And what the right way to respond is, Sometimes we may never see why God let us go through the things he let us go through. We may never see why he allowed some of those ripples to catch up to us. But we can still rest in the knowledge. He said, God works all things together for good to those who love him. Part of the peace that I have comes from knowing that whatever consequences I do reap in this life, they're nothing They're nothing compared to what I deserve. 
I deserve death. So any consequence that may still be out there waiting for me somewhere in the future, it's nothing compared to what I deserve. And I can rest in God's love. Perfect love casts out fear. There is another more powerful reason that I can live free from fear about my past, and that's the knowledge that God works all things for my good. God works all things together for good to those who love him. In conclusion this morning, this is my challenge. This is my encouragement to you today. Live in the power of love that God has provided for you. We do not have to live in bondage to fear. We do not have to live under a threat of intimidation about our past if those things are under the blood. We can live 100% in the power of love. There is no fear in love, John says, because perfect love casts out fear. We can live in confidence. When you live in the power of love, you show the world whose child you are. It's the only reasonable thing to do. I challenge you today to take advantage of the peace that passes understanding. Live in the power of love. Shall we stand? Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your truth. We thank you for your love that gives us power to live, to conquer our fears. We pray now that as we leave this place that you would help us to do just that, to embrace your love in every part of our lives, to embrace your will for our lives, to love you, to love the things that you love, to love our brothers. May you be honored and glorified in our lives. Give us the peace that passes understanding, we pray. It's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Shake hands, be friendly. You are dismissed.